We are live. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story once a week. I'm Gerald. I'm Remy. I'm Maya. And I'm Anise. And this week we're discussing depth perception by... <laughs> Sorry, I'll do that again. Um... This week we're discussing depth perception by Laura M. Gibson. If you don't want to be spoiled, pause the podcast, go read the story, and then come back to us. The story opens with the narrator, 32-year-old Lily, in the first person, informing us immediately that she's a paramedic and that she was attending the death of her uncle Lou in a booth at the back of a bar. In flashback, she tells us the story of how she came to be living with her uncle, with her mother and sister, on the run from an abusive father. Interspersed with that backstory, the author progresses the present day story, giving insight into her character and her relationship with her work colleague, Stu. So top level, how did everybody feel about this story? I loved it. I second it. Third, I liked it a lot too. Fourth? Ooh. Uh, Whoa. Whoa. What? Really? All of us? All of us. Yeah. It's been a while since that happened. Yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed this story. There was a couple points where the author almost lost me and then she just reeled me right back in. And yeah, it was really enjoyable. I laughed out loud in a cafe once and I started to cry at the end. And that's when I knew yeah. that I was in love with this author. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I looked at when when I shared the link earlier this week, I I thought I'll just have a look at it and, and I sort of read the first paragraph and I just couldn't stop reading it and I just carried on until I finished it. It's one of those stories. Yeah. Here we are. That's it. Did it? <laughs> End of discussion. <laughs> okay, so what are we submitting for next week? No, I'm joking. Remy, how, any elaboration on how this story made you feel? Uh, it was nice. It really felt like these were actual events that had happened. And I was reading uh, someone's description of, of her life story. So I really enjoyed it. And it, I mean, there were a lot of elements that were very unique, like her being a female paramedic and even in the story saying that she was the first woman to hold that position in three counties. And the, the, the rural setting uh, of it being like, um, I guess, yeah, it's like a farm or like countryside type of thing. Um, so it was, it was very rustic. It was, I, I like, you know, back in the day when like kids were wearing overalls and stuff. And <laughs> I like those times walking along the train tracks. <laughs> yeah. Sitting by the dock of the bay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in the, in the wrong century or something. <laughs> I feel that way, yeah. <laughs> and that's why we love him. Yeah. <laughs> One of the reasons why we love him. Thanks. Yeah, I, 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 I loved her, her description. I loved, I loved how she, um, you know, craft-wise, her, her writing was was really, really good, um, and she painted a lovely picture, but of, of locations and situations, but didn't overdo it. Not you know, very straightforward and and plain use of plain words but but in a in a very sort of constructive way similar to what rami was saying it felt like an essay to me which is something that we know carve strives for and they fall off very well remember the first story we read from carve was eminence by caroline casper and it had that same feeling of like mm. is this fiction or is somebody actually telling me their story right now um yeah it feels a little memoirist in tradition yeah Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the things that came up for me as I was reading the story, and I hate to make the comparison because they are very different. Um, is 
but the visuals, how strong the visuals of this small town environment is, and this loving description of men that are a little rough around the edges, um, reminded me of Annie Prulo. Is that is that how you pronounce her last name, Prulo? Um, and her uh, short story collection, uh, Midwestern Tales, because these the the men that are surrounding the narrator that you know protect her and love her are these small town gruff around the edges manly men and the way they're described could be very coarse but it their coarseness is described in a very loving and amazing way to me like you know when luke kills her dad you know, it isn't this drawn out scene. It very well could have been this drawn out scene and he's dying and the girls are crying. No, it was, they go inside the house and he's talking to them and he doesn't look out the window, but he knows where he shot this guy because he shoots deer and stuff all the time. And he knows about how long it's gonna take for him to bleed out. And when it's time, he just gets up and makes a phone call to the corner. Like there's a gruffness and a reality there that is described, but it's not overdone and sentimentalized. Yeah, I think I think that I think you're right. I think it's 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 really good that 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 she has these these quite strong, very male characters, but shows the caring side to them as well, which, which you know, which is a, 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 a quite a difficult thing to do. She's she's not she's not writing stereotypes. It's one of those days. <laughs> is, it, is it a lag? I don't know. I don't know if there's a lag or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Nobody said anything to the lag, so I'm like, maybe there is. I always have internet anyway. <laughs> You're killing me. You're killing me. So uh, let's let's dig in a little deeper so that this podcast doesn't just totally go into a lull. This is why I hate stories that are universally good. This is why it's so hard to have a vibrant discussion when everyone's like, yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> it just doesn't work. We need a story we can hate, <laughs> but not to hate. Otherwise, we end up like last week. So, <laughs> so my question for you is, as I was reading this story, one of the things that kept coming up is, is fire, like the symbol of fire. So what what did that bring up for you? Did you guys spot that? Were there any other symbols that you guys latched on to as you were reading the story? Okay, well, with fire, I feel like um, it's sort of hearkened to sort of the kind of traditional symbols of fire as something that is cleansing, it's a bit of a crucible. Um, it, it's noteworthy, like, you know, with the fire that everyone that dies is cremated instead of buried. Um, and burning the barn is cathartic. She has that moment where she realizes that not letting Lou have done it the day that Elizabeth Carlson died was kind of cruel. And then she needs to do it by the end of the story. So I feel like there is that sort of idea of like from ashes, you know, to ashes and then possibly rebirth. Uh, but there was another parallel that I, that I picked, another symbol that I picked up on, which was there's this moment where she talks about how on the ranch, she learned how to lay down roots. And there's this parallel there between gardening because she learns how to garden. And also it's the first time she isn't running around in fear from Bill. She gets to live there for at this point, 20 something years, but 20 years. Um, I thought that was really beautiful as well. Yeah, I, I would second that on the roots, even to the point where it's brought up a little later on when it's mentioned that now that there's gonna be three ashes, three people in this yard and the idea that Lou always joked around about being mulch for the garden. And I mean, essentially that is putting your ashes in the ground and allowing new plants to grow up in place of that. And so there is a lot of renewal in the story. You know, you traditionally think of fire and it's like you burn to ashes, then from ashes, something rises out of the ashes. That is the traditional meaning. And I definitely think that that's there, but it's reinforced by the root metaphor for sure. Um, I also like, you know, before sh her and Stu have their little quabble, which is kind of adorable. I laughed out loud. It was kind of cute. Um, so when they had their little quabble, you know, it was 
they work as paramedics and there are fire engines going out. And, you know, throughout this story, there's that symbol. And I get the sense that through her, through her uncle's death, she's finally going to find strength. She's going to be able to be renewed and she's going to end up with Stu and live happily ever after and have a 50 million babies. <laughs> At least that's what I hope for her. <laughs> Aw, see, there it is. I'm proof. I am a romantic, just like Rami. I just hide it better. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's a line I would totally say. <laughs> I, I think the the fight with Stu, what, I love that scene as well, Maya. And also, I thought it was really telling because, like, they kind of argued like a long term couple already, where they don't have to say what the issue is. They can just be like, "Oh, this thing again." Like everyone knows what that one thing in their relationship is that you don't have to mention. It just, you know, you can just immediately get switched on. And it was like one of those. Yeah. And, and throughout, you know, when her uncle is constantly like, you know, you should try him out. You should lighten up a little bit. You've got a future to think about. Don't end up dying here with me. You know, she, he's kind of nudging her to this possible new life that she's literally got right in front of her. Um, so yeah, I totally laughed out loud at that scene. There was something, something very loving and gruff and, you know, she's just as rough around the edges as he is. He, like he's her perfect match. And it was just really precious. <laughs> I, I quite like the way that she used her false eye too. She she used that as as almost as a weapon um, when she talked about it at school, and she mentioned it earlier on when they were having the the the, the disagreement. Um, and and but then he brings her eye to the to the the ranch or, the, or to the house, and he says, "Funny, I always thought it would be round. It just it, it's just <laughs> you know it's just the." taking away the tension demystifying it it's it just yeah he's just a regular guy he's just and he's not and he, he, he says something about um not being scared of her or something or something like that even more than a weapon she used her eye to distance herself from other people you know she her sister doesn't know how she really lost her eye she uses it when the kids are teasing her and she wants them to leave her alone so she wields it and freaks them out and makes them run off there's all these points where it's her protective mechanism she always makes sure she has a spare you know it's brought up several times i think that's very symbolic the fact that it's brought up several times when when good writers bring up stuff multiple times that's like signposting that's like a big neon sign saying look at me look at me what am i doing here and it is brought up several times that she constantly has this with her and for him to suddenly turn around and bring the thing that she uses to push people away was very symbolic and beautifully done. And it was a way to do that thing without it being over sentimental and annoying. Because he could have come and brought her flowers. Or I thought it was going to be an engagement ring when he opens his hand. <laughs> that would have been really sappy. I kind of was like, I don't, there was a moment where I thought that was going to happen. I was like, no, don't do that. Don't ruin it. Don't ruin the story. And then I was like, oh, thank God. That would have been too much too soon, too fast. No, no, no. Yeah, way yeah. too much too soon, too fast. It would have been cluster clustering. <laughs> yeah, I was going to point out the eye as well. Gerald beat me to it. Um, in the very beginning, she felt self-conscious about it because the kids were teasing her. But as Maya said later on, she recognized that she can use it as a source of empowerment. And then uh, even further after that, I guess it led to feelings of attachment with Stu. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and she, she references it right, right near the end. Um... He, he said, uh, Stu stood tall, his mouth working over the last shard of a lemon drop, waiting to be invited, holding my eye. I could feel all the punch going out of me. It's, it's yep. you know, really nice. All, all, of, all of her sort of anger and, and, and her, her, her sort of, um, not her strength, but, but all of her aggressiveness was... Yeah, was, her resistance. Yeah, yeah. I like when she says, I'm not going to apologize for being stubborn. I feel like Stu and everyone reading the story is like, we know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and his perfect response, I know. Oh, yeah. 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 <sighs> oh. I love men like that. <laughs> yeah, Stu seems like a catch, girl. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> total catch. <laughs> So how did we feel about the language in the story? Yeah, no updates. My my sort of writing, my my sort of you know non floweriness, but but nicely constructed sentences and and um, beautiful descriptions. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do. I can, I can feel the writing on the wall. <laughs> Are you waxing poetic? Have you tweeted her yet? And like, hey, I read your story. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see my eye? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's funny. I really enjoyed the language and I recognize it as really good writing. And I, this just comes down to taste, even though it was great. And it wasn't suffering from MFA voice at all. I think she has her own no. voice, which mm. I appreciated a lot. Um, I think. I really enjoy when there's a little bit of a tease. There's a little bit of like a more jokiness in writing. So for me, it's like this was very beautiful and very good. But I didn't find myself like highlighting stuff all the time like I do when there's like a writer who's more like impish, I guess you can say. Which, I mean, this isn't, this story probably wouldn't do too well with impishness anyway. So for what she's writing and for the themes, I think this voice was perfect. Um, but I didn't find myself underlining anything. But one thing I did notice while reading it was that the pacing on this was so well controlled. I thought the pacing was great. Yeah. Yeah. The slow reveal yeah. of the history was just at the right moment. How about and you, Remy? The moments of action, things sped up, like uh, in the encounters with Bill. You kind of had a sense of suspense and things started moving quicker and the girls hiding and then uh, Uncle Lou pulling up and the confrontations and the tension when he came when they were during their party. Mm. Is that very well portrayed? Yep. I'm looking at you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Gerald. I know you like the writing because I can see the writing on your face. <laughs> Is that obvious? Yes, it's that obvious. Was there anything about the writing you didn't like? Nope. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to be the only one that doesn't completely wax poetic about the writing. I loved, um, I loved the visuals. I loved the use of language like this was language that kind of just flowed into me like water but there were several times where the transitions almost lost me and the author was skilled enough to bring me back but there were a few times when i was like how long is this going to be kind of thing and it, I noticed it was at transitions um, where the scenes were changing really, really drastically. And she would almost lose me for half a paragraph. And then I would be right back into the story again. And I don't know what that is, but it was definitely something I noticed as I was reading it. Um, I would also say that this story structurally, it, while it isn't as skilled as, it reminds me of Alice Munro and that there's a lot happening in a really, really small space. So while it's only 6,000 words, which is a little long for us, sometimes some of our short stories have been even shorter than that, but it's still, it's only 6,000 words, you're reading it, there's so much happening that the pace slows down and it feels longer than the 6,000 words. It feels like a novel that's been squished into a short story form. And sometimes when that happens, I do get that loping, lulling feeling where every once in a while I'm like, okay, how much longer is this gonna go? Um, and it's not that the story itself was long, it's the way it was paced. Um, feels longer than the story actually is. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, I just, I can recognize in my reading that she almost lost me a couple of times, but she managed to reel me back in really quickly. Yeah, I think it felt longer because it was longer. It's, it's over 9,000 words. No, it was only six. Mm -hmm. Nine and a half thousand words. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. Rammy search. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
think Gerald had pointed it out in the beginning, which I appreciate because then I knew what I was getting into. <laughs> Instead of it being a surprise. I, I, I knew it was quite a, quite a long story, so I just wanted to make sure. It felt know, like even longer than that. It felt like it very well could mm. have ended up being a novella. Like there's so much happening. There's so many little like things like how they figure out how her sister died. It's like this quick comma that just happens you know when she goes into the hospital and this other girl is dying of the same thing and they find out and she overhears them talking about hunter virus and then the memories go back to laying underneath the car where there were all those mice and and then she realizes how her sister died like it was such like a footnote yeah in the story that it almost if you blinked you missed it <laughs> Oh, and he's disappeared. What I was wondering, and I guess this can naturally occur, but since her and her sister were always together, how come her sister contracted this disease, but not her? Um, her sister was a couple years younger, so her immune system wouldn't have been as strong. Plus, in addition to her being older, she'd already gone through like medical stuff. And so I, I'm just assuming her, um, her resistance to viruses were probably stronger than her sister, just based on mm. exposure to medical crap, being in a hospital with her eye, being a little bit older, being a little bit stronger. Um, to me, that that was the only thing that made sense. Mm. Yep. Okay, we lost Annie's. She'll be back soon. Mm. Hopefully. Oh. Yeah, her computer froze. She's rebooting. Okay. 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 <clears throat> it's, it's it's sort of kind of hard to, to find something more to say about it, isn't it? Really. It's, yeah, I think it's... when she comes back, we're probably just going to go right into rating because. I mean, it literally is the problem of having a story that is so well written that all of us like it. Mm. You know, yeah. when I think about the symbolism in the story, there there was a lot, but you know, it was it was very plainly written. It was be very beautifully written, and there really isn't a lot to dissect in the story. Um, this is an author I definitely want to read more of for sure. Um, I would say she. Her writing to me isn't at the level of like Annie Prullo or Alice Munro, but she's a writer that I can see her being there very shortly. Mm. Mm. Yeah, she, she does know? have that, that same sort of honest, not sparse, but, but not, it, it's just a, a, a sort of, it's really hard to describe, isn't it? Because it, it's, it's, not, it's not punchy writing. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a, a relaxed style of writing, um, but it, it, everything's in there, all the descriptions in there. Um, it's like an honest it's... unfolding of life. <laughs> yeah, that could be, yeah. Stories, I do. Um, hmm. it, it is a little hard um, sometimes. I, like when I read this story, I wondered, <laughs> I think if I hadn't have read so many short stories up until this point, like if we would have read this at the beginning of the literary roadhouse, I don't think I actually would have liked it as much. I think um, I've become a better reader over time. And there are things about the story that I can see and I can appreciate now that if I had read it two years ago, I might not have even noticed and I might have put it down during one of those lulls. So, um, I think this is definitely a reader's writer, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. Um, this isn't like this isn't a TV show. This is a BBC miniseries. <laughs> 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 you know, it, it's like four episodes. It's not twenty-two. Yeah. Um, to chew on emotionally, but there isn't a lot to chew on as far as like dissecting and technical stuff. It's just technically. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and these. Come on. Maybe she's still rebooting. 
Okay. My phone. Um, can you text her and see if she is back online yet or not? Maybe she's having a hangout problem or is it still a computer problem? <clears throat> nope, that wasn't her. I saw my computer blink and I got all excited. It's like, yeah, she's back. Oh, I guess not. Almost there, she says. Okay, good. Do, do, do. Do, do. <laughs> Is it warm where you are? Yeah, I closed all the windows to try to keep out some of the outside noise. Um, okay. This house where I'm at, um, it doesn't have a lot of insulation. Like, it's a really old house. And I'm up in the music room, and there's windows on like all sides, and there's huge windows floor to ceiling along that hallway back there. And so I closed them all. I closed everything, and now I'm just dying. But take a look at my ceiling. You're going to crack up. What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and um, cool. yeah, <laughs> there's all kinds of weird stuff. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I tried to get my head in front of it for censoring purposes in case we have any kids watching. But, you know, if it's a boy child, he's seen it. And if it's a girl child, she will probably see one someday, unless she's gay, in which case she'll still see one because they're all over the internet. So there you go. <laughs> I tried to put my head in front of it, like yeah. <laughs> censoring the painting on the wall. But um, yeah, it's not going to work. You just have to see him pissing the galaxy. <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, it's just interesting. It's an interesting room. Anyways, I don't think you got to see my ceiling. It's it's a little Alice in Wonderland up there. Oh wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good news. Audacity recovered my first track. Yes. <laughs> good job, Audacity. Well good job, Audacity. Okay, we were getting ready to wind down, and we wanted to hear any additional thoughts that you had about this story. Only two. Uh, one was when you were saying that the transition sometimes slowed you down. Okay, I thought that was just me because I read this very tired. I'm glad it wasn't just me. There were some changes between present day and past day where I was, I, it took me about half a paragraph to realize what time I was Oh, at. okay. Yeah, so me too. Um, and the other thing was there was one time when I did like a little like laugh out loud, which is when the kids are collecting mountain lion scat. I thought that was... <laughs> Okay, which is, brings me to another symbol, because at that point I was like, oh, that's how our sister's going to die. They're going to go out there and going to find a real mountain lion. <laughs> but no, it was the dad. <laughs> she did die because of poop. Yeah, she did die because of poop. But she also yeah. died because of her father, but not because her father killed her, but because her father was there and she was trying to hide in the poop. So, yeah, very interesting. But I don't think Good it call. was from that one incident, was it? It couldn't have been. Well, like, was, I think maybe it was prolonged. Um, Tonto virus, you just need to get it in you. You need to inhale it. So just being in a space where there's a lot of like mice droppings isn't necessarily going to give it to you. But being in a space where there's a lot of mouse droppings and you're breathing really deeply and you're kicking up dust might. Mm. Remember, and, yeah. Yeah, that Lily pushed Macy's face into the ground to keep her silent. So she got mm. in close to that poop. Yeah, and she was inhaling and kicking, and all that dust was getting kicked up. So, yeah, that is what it is. And so are we ready to rate this puppy? I yep. think we are. Okay, who wants to go first? I'll go first. Six. Oh, wow. Why, why did that surprise me? Why? I mean, it was so obvious that six was, was coming down from the sky and settling on your head. Anyone that's ever watched our show knew that was coming and still it surprised me just a little bit. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, 
for me, I love this story so, so much. This is an author I definitely want to read more of. I've already compared her to two of my favorite short story authors, but she's just not quite to that level yet, but oh, she's getting there. And so I'm, I want to give it a five and a half, but I'm going to be honest. I, I place it at a, at a five. Like it's really, really good. And she will be a six. I'm sure like, She's working on a novel. I can't wait to read it. But for me, this story was close, but just barely missed the mark. Yeah, I think I'm similar to Maya in that. See, so this is weird. If I'm like rating on like, how well, how good are you at crafting a story? Well, she's the story. I don't know how it could be improved. It's just a matter of taste. So when it, mm -hmm. so it's like, it's really good, like six quality. But when it comes to Annie's personal tastes, there's other things that maybe I like more, so it comes down to a five for me as well. I'm gonna go with six, like Gerald. Still very See, high that didn't Gerald. surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about this writer, I really just like her. I can't wait to read more of her work. So what are we submitting for next week? I'm looking at my list of Charles Bukowski. I've got to go with something different than last time, but all of his titles are horrible. So I'm going to go with a horrible title that sounds like it might not be a horrible story. I'm going Charles Bukowski's politics is like trying to screw a cat in the ass. <laughs> you win just for the title alone. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rami, what uh, you want? All right, sure. I'm um, gonna stick with the same one I did from last time, and it is Bluebell Meadow by Benedict Kiley. Okay, and I'm putting in one that I did. Oh no! Oh, she. Oh, you she mastiff, but I crashed. No, you're back. You're back. Oh, okay. I said, I'll just say it again for you guys, but it's ready in the recording. Um, I'm submitting Mastiff by Joyce Carol Oates. Okay. Okay. We've just got a, a fairly short, short quiz this time. Um, it's because we had a quiz about parts of the body not long ago, didn't we? Because I was going to do something like that because they were paramedics. Um, but since the author comes from Idaho, it's a quiz about Idaho. Yay. I bet you're all thrilled about that, aren't you? Mm, yes. So. <laughs> okay, multiple choice answers, um, just two rounds, and there's a tiebreaker. Uh, so, as they appear on my screen, an ace. Uh, near Arco, Idaho, you can tour the world's first. Is it Doll Hospital, Underground Department Store, Erotic Art Museum, or Nuclear Power Plant? Doll Hospital. Wrong. It's the world's first nuclear power plant. Really? That's exciting. Yeah. There's some crazy. interesting options you give. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it weren't my options. They they came with the quiz. I can assure you. Uh, that. That's how you made it up. <laughs> I was ready for oh, Doll Hospital. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, Maya. What river mm -hmm. flows through Hell's Canyon? Is it Snake River? Missouri, Columbia, or Colorado? What were the options again? Snake River, Missouri, Columbia, or Colorado River? Missouri. Wrong, it's the Snake River. No, no, Snake really, River. He really says good that like your... he knew this before the quiz. Hmm. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. What? Sure. Who wouldn't know that? Um, Rigby, Idaho is the birthplace of Philip Farnsworth. This is for Rami, inventor of sewing machine, television, stethoscope, Monopoly. Um, Monopoly. The quiz says television. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, Interesting. 
Yeah, I think someone else took that. So, after round one, no score. <laughs> okay, round two. Anais, in Blackfoot, you can see the world's largest roller rink, chessboard, potato chip, Rubik's Cube. Potato chip. Is the correct answer. Of nice. course. Yeah, we'd all love to see that, wouldn't we? <laughs> Maya, <laughs> in the town of... The Germans will say Weiser, W-E-I-S-E-R. In the town of Weiser, or Weiser, there's a yearly contest dedicated to this activity. Is it? <laughs> Is it yawning, knitting, hopscotch, or fiddling? Fiddling. Is the <coughs> correct answer, of course. Yeah, you see, yeah. Getting into the swing of this Idaho quiz. And finally, Rami. <laughs> what famous woman was named Idaho's first professional woman by the Idaho Federation of <laughs> Business and Professional Women? Was it Betsy Moss? I don't know how to pronounce this. Sacagawea. 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 Thank you. Uh, yeah. Amelia Earhart. <laughs> or Elizabeth Dole. Amelia Earhart. Wrong. It's that one I couldn't pronounce. It's Sacagawea? Yeah. Really? I find yeah. that surprising that the first one will go to a non-white lady. Mm. Yeah. That's my low yeah. expectations of the United States right now. <laughs> hey. Okay. So yeah, they only gave it to her after they changed her entire history and tried to make her into a romantic figure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So now we have a tie break. How exciting. This is, this is peak excitement here. Uh, between Anais and Maya, mm -hmm. and the it's time so break. I know, I know, I, I don't get out much. Um, so, in July 2015, what was this nearest will win? What was the population of Idaho? Oh God! Uh, Anais first. Uh, <laughs> people are cows. <laughs> or potato chips. <laughs> I think it's people. I presume it's people. Two million. Okay. One point three. And actually, by a very, very tiny margin, um, Anais wins because it's one point six five four million. That is a tiny margin. Oh, that's Sheesh. a tiny margin. Good I'm guesses. I'm not both of us were that close, to be honest. Yeah, me uh, too. We have uh, to read two so stories. What are we reading? So what are we reading next week? Uh, we are reading Mastiff by Joyce Carol Oates. Okay. But before cool. you go, join our pig roast party in the comment section at literaryroadhouse.com. Also, we're looking for you, always, in the review section at iTunes, Stitcher, and Spreaker. By the way, when will you do something nice for yourself and let into your life the people who love you? For example, the hosts of our other shows, the Literary Roadhouse Book Club and the Bradbury Challenge. Also, when we burn down our barn to exercise our demons, we also burn down a lot of supplies. Help support our barn expenses and podcast expenses at patreon.com slash literary roadhouse. Every bit helps. And as always, share this podcast with a good-hearted uncle in your life. Until next time, <laughs> read a good story. Uh, hey. <laughs> I occasionally find myself having to hold back my laughs so not to interrupt you. <laughs> the part where we're stalking people. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I've got to get out of here so I can set up Bradbury Challenge and get ready for a meeting. And I will see you later. Okay. All right. See Ciao. You. Bye. Bye.